school. Peppa, over to you. Thank you, Nairi. Um, so we're here to talk about uh, the future of politics in this panel. Um, as you'll have noticed, the Blavatnik School uh, is in Oxford, but outward facing to the world. And that's very much where this panel is coming from. There's a lot of volatility in politics right now that's, that's roiling countries from Brazil to Germany. Uh, but many of these ructions we observed first uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, and so we thought we would start with an observation from one of the preeminent experts uh, on British politics to situate the problem that is facing the, um, the, the past instrument of mobilizing participation into politics, the political party uh, here in the United Kingdom. Uh, to my right, this is Professor uh, Jane Green, uh, who's a professor of uh, British politics at Oxford um, and was the uh, research communicator of the year. So she not only knows the data, she can talk about it. And she's one of the directors of the British election study. So she's best placed to tell us about what's going on in politics, to understand what the challenges for the parties are, what's going on with the electorates. Um, but we're not just about problems, as Nairi has told us repeatedly, we're about solutions. Uh, and to my left, we have two solutions. We had elections that were problematic or at least challenging from our perspective uh, in, in Germany and Brazil. We have solutions that are flowing in from Germany and Brazil. Um, so Miguel Lago is the co-founder and director of uh, Mayo Rio, a, a group in, um, in, in, in Brazil that, look, that uses platforms to connect citizens to what's going on with government to enable them to participate. Benjamin Snow, to my far left, is the director of, uh, and CEO of a Civocracy, um, a group that uh, is bringing citizens into politics um, around Europe and thinking about um, how technology can make politics work better. And what I've asked them to talk about is how they've succeeded uh, in, in introducing positive innovations at a time that's very challenging. Um, and what we can learn from those innovations, especially for the very challenging problem that David Fine mentioned of how do we scale things up and can they be scaled up to, uh, to, to a bigger level. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to give the word to Jane to start. Thank you so much. So thank you. And I want to say good morning because I don't want to be rude. Um, <laughs> it was inspiring to hear your talk. So thank you so much. Um, right. So what are the challenges facing traditional political parties? That question has been bothering people like myself for years, predominantly focusing on Western democracies, and that's the literature that I'm going to be thinking about just extremely briefly just now. So the dominant view, and let's see if this is going to work right. The dominant view, the kind of conventional wisdom, what we think we knew or what we think we know, is that traditional political parties have been in decline. And so if you think about the formation of parties and party systems across Western Europe and other industrialized countries, you think about parties forming with very deep social bases and then having an inbuilt advantage as those parties then are the larger parties that scoop up support and make it very difficult for entrant parties to compete within that political environment. And of course, nowhere is that more challenging for entrant parties than in a majoritarian electoral system such as we have in Britain. So from that start of being dominant and rooted in society and having that support, what we've seen is the decline in support for mainstream parties. So we've seen the decline in support for traditional parties. We've also seen a decline in support in terms of electoral turnout, so less participation in elections and more of a kind of general sense of rejection of mainstream politics and mainstream politicians and possibly possibly different ways of doing politics. And you know, the big question is whether or not those kinds of new ways of doing politics have kind of taken the place of other forms of electoral participation. So we thought, so I'm going to just put that up there and leave that for a second and say, well, let me now tell you a very brief story. We were very happily, as the British election study team, writing a book about the 2015 general election in Britain. And that was a general election that saw the highest support for non-mainstream political parties that we'd ever seen. And our story was about fragmentation, about rejection of mainstream parties, and about this story. And then, of course, we had a referendum. And then our prime minister decided to call another general election. And what I want to suggest to you today is that actually, possibly, the Great British case tells us that this might actually not have been correct. 
that under certain circumstances, it is possible for mainstream political parties to capture the support of the electorate. So when I was talking about decline, when I was talking about declines in turnout, the very observant of you who know British politics, and I'm not expecting anybody to um, be as committed to that task as myself, certainly, but you, know, you will know that in Britain, that we've seen a very substantial change in the last two years. And I think that one of the things this has taught us is that we've actually probably misunderstood the major trends and the reasons, some of the reasons for what's been going on. So this is the Labour and Conservative combined vote share since 1964 to 2017. And what you see here is the decline thesis with an extremely substantial increase in support for the dominant parties. Now this of course does not mean that people have fallen in love with Labour and Conservative parties, the traditional parties in Britain, but what it does suggest is that under certain circumstances it's possible for mainstream parties to still capture the vast majority of votes and of course within our electoral system. And so this is a, a really, really dramatic shift in a two-year period and we see support for the two mainstream parties not being that high for over 30, 40 year period. So not since 1970 have we seen that level of support for the two mainstream parties. I'm also going to show you a figure about electoral turnout, participation in UK elections. And you can really be forgiving, forgiven for not kind of picking up on this, even as a, someone who's really paying close attention to British politics. We're actually, across a variety of measures of turnout, and the graph that I'm going to show you now is using a paper where we're sort of worrying about how to count turnout. So there's a few lines here. But all of these measures of turnout, so this is from 1979 to 2017, show that turnout, yes, saw a decline. It was very low in the 2001 general election. And yet, across all of these measures, across every single one of these measures, there was an increase in 2016 for the referendum. But nevertheless, we've seen a substantial increase with 2017 being the highest general election turnout since 1997. And so that kind of decline thesis looks a bit odd in the British case. And of course, our story was like, oh my gosh, how do we finish this book? Because now this book that was about decline and fragmentation and rejection of these uh, mainstream parties suddenly became about this, suddenly became about volatility, about change. How can we understand the kind of long-term factors that are making the electorate have the potential to show these trends and these trends? decline in support for mainstream parties and an increase in support for mainstream parties. What's going on? And we look at not just the long-term trends, but also sort of major short-term factors, and I'm more than happy to talk about that. So what is happening? So I'm going to call this vol the volatility thesis and say that perhaps the decline thesis was an example of volatility, but it doesn't necessarily need to be the whole story. And I hope this is a bit more positive in the sort of vein of what you've been doing over the last 24 hours. So what have we seen? We've seen increasing switching between major parties. This is the aggregate volatility, so how much party shares are changing between each British election over time. And we go really far back here to the early part of the 19th century. We see you know, hugely volatile elections around the extension of universal suffrage. But these elections, 2015 and 2017, are the most volatile that we've seen. So if you felt that things were becoming volatile and you didn't have like kind of, you know, an example to put your finger on to say that they are becoming more volatile, then this is an example of that. So the two most recent British elections have been extremely dramatically different. And that's um, a very, very important thing to understand. Not only at the level of aggregate vote shares, we've also seen volatility increasing between at, at the individual level. So we can use with British election study data going back to the 1960s, the same people who are interviewed in after one election and look at their, see someone told me that that was gonna happen. Um, oh, ah, let's see. Oh, oh, sorry, you saw that. You didn't see the screen change and I can't see anything. Okay, so at the individual level, we can see looking at people's reported vote choice in elections and then their reported vote choice in a subsequent election, just how much the same people are switching their vote choices over time. So we kind of see the big picture on the surface level of volatility and this is the under the bonnet 
look at volatility. And what this shows using British data, again, using the British election study, and we're trying to gather data, panel data, where you're saying people are interviewed over time to look at this in more countries. But what we see, of course, is that individual level volatility high, was extremely high in 2015, but is nevertheless on an upward trend. And what that means is that the system has the greater potential to deliver change and unpredictability and all of those things that we're seeing in, in elections in this country. And possibly I would suggest maybe this is part of the explanation in other countries too. Now, of course, this isn't the only, you know, there's lots and lots of work that we're doing to try to understand these trends. But very importantly, I think one of the things that can help us understand these kind of what might seem like sort of strange things to combine, right? So on the one hand, you had the rejection of mainstream parties, and then you have this huge swing to the mainstream parties in this country and an increase in electoral turnout. What's going on? So we've got a more volatile electorate, but a more electorate that's more willing to participate in elections, certainly than in previous elections. And so one of the really important things here is the rise of a second dimension. And there was mention earlier of identity politics and kind of, you know, we seem to be in this strange new political environment where identity is everything. But I think sort of more simply or, or perhaps additionally, one of the important things that has happened over time is the increasing importance of issues that don't load on to what we would think of as the kind of traditional economic axis. And instead, we might call them liberal authoritarian issues. So issues around crime, issues around immigration, issues around liberal lifestyles, different um, ways of, um, um, different ways of you know, choosing different lifestyles. And also, I think, you know, issues here of the environment and those issues that might help us understand this sort of cosmopolitan or more nationalistic dimension and would also help us understand in the terms of liberal authoritarian dimension. So what we've seen over time is, and these are the left-right issues. This is the salience of left-right issues in Britain. So these are all the economics issues. And we've seen those be really high. But what we've seen at the same time, and this was the financial crisis um, here, but what we've seen is the rise of the issue of not just immigration, but also those other issues that load onto the liberal authoritarian dimension. And so we need to see politics in an increasingly two-dimensional way in the countries that we're, you know, where we see the rise of populism, where we see the rise of the far right, where we see, you know, very challenging demonstrations of very substantial volatility. The challenge for traditional parties is that they are having to compete in a two-dimensional framework. So rather than just based on economics, this is an authoritarian liber or liberal or libertarian dimension, and this is the economic left, right. And what we're seeing in many countries is that the authoritarian left part of this quadrant hasn't been especially well represented. And so voters in these, we're holding these sorts of sets of views have felt that the system hasn't been working especially well for them in terms of representation, and of course, more widely. So this is a different way of thinking about the challenges that mainstream political parties face. It's not a kind of given. It's not necessarily always the case that the challenge is the rejection of mainstream parties under so certain circumstances, this volatile electorate can shift towards the mainstream parties when those mainstream parties are competing on both those dimensions successfully. And of course, that's what we saw with the Labour and Conservative parties in Britain, who managed to compete in the 2017 election, both on left-right, but also on this liberal authoritarian or nationalist Brexit, in our instance, dimension. And so we have unstable support for all parties. We have cross-cutting issues. We still have the same kinds of people excluded from politics and voting. So we haven't seen a surge in participation and turnout amongst the youngest voters. We've seen an increasing relationship between age and vote choice in this country. And I think, you know, we can't avoid the fact that there's a major question about just how much people see the system as working for them. But at least in the British instance, it seems that people are more willing to participate in politics to um, redress or at least speak to some of those challenges in the system. Thank you. So Miguel, the challenge has been put on the table. Um, there's unstable support. There's some systemic weakness. Um, and what do we see going on in, in your case in Brazil? 
Well, uh, I, I, well, <clears throat> so thank, first of all, thank you very much for, for this invitation. It's an honor to be here. It's a great conference. Uh, and I think it's Peter Maris, uh, the, the, the political scientist, uh, who had coined the, the term of cartel parties uh, to, to describe the, the, the process in which uh, the, the center of gravity of parties has swifted from civil society to the state. So, so political parties, and especially traditional political parties, being much more dependent on and anchored on the state rather than in, the, in their membership, including financially. Um, and, 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 and this, all this, uh, it was amazing hearing you and, and, uh, and, and seeing that the decline of political parties is perhaps not um, exactly uh, what we thought it, it, it was, but certainly there is a disconnection between political parties and their memberships. And, uh, uh, and this causes certainly some re representation uh, uh, um, uh, issues and, and problems. And, and, and one of the, the, uh, one of, one of the phenomena that the di digital era brings us, uh, I think there are mainly two uh, that, that affects the representation, is that first of all, uh, the, the architecture of the social networks, especially Facebook, has an affinity with <coughs> promoting populist leaders uh, so much more uh, personalities rather than institutions. So this is the first thing. The second one is that political consent has shifted uh, from a, a general uh, social contract framework to a much more fragmented and continuous process. So, uh, so we're, uh, we're giving political consents and we are building political consent uh, at, at every political decision. So, 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 so this really poses problems in, in, in order of representation of, of people in, uh, in the political system and, and, and the idea of intermediation on a, a digital era in a connected world. One of the, I think there are many ways to tackle that, having more populist leaders inside traditional parties, which is the case of, 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 many, of, many, of many parties, uh, uh, changing uh, the, 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 and, and having innovative political parties. Uh, having civic tech experience, but also something that, uh, that we work with that are civic mobilization infrastructures. And, and civic mobilization infrastructures has, have, uh, uh, essentially, they, they, they meet two important criteria for intermediation of political process. The first one, uh, in terms of, that could meet the representation uh, um, uh, role of a political party, of a trade union, or something like that, is that uh, it enables and it's, it serves as a platform for, uh, for people to voice a political preference. So this is the first uh, uh, political mission of a, of, a, of a civic mobilization infrastructure. The second one uh, will be much more connected to uh, making sure that people can affect public decision making through their mobilization. So, uh, so in the sense also uh, uh, having uh, some kind of, of government uh, uh, role uh, uh, that, 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 uh, that the intermediation enables traditionally. So, so basically what we with, uh, created in, in, in Brazil uh, was a, a network of civic mobilization infrastructures locally focused, so in, in many Brazilian cities. So uh, always with three uh, uh, core missions. Uh, the first one, I'm sorry, I have a presentation here and, and I'm talking. I don't know where my presentation is. Uh. I forgot to... <laughs> No, no problem. We can we can do it without the presentation. Let's see if we can get through. Yes, you, you keep talking. Ah, yeah, there is. Okay, so um, so here the civic mobilization infrastructure has has three main uh, 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 does three main things. So first of all, it creates campaigns that affect public policies that can change public policies through mass mobilization. Second, it engages continuously uh, its constituency. So uh, so it, we're not only talking about one. Uh, 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 one kind of campaign that affects, or one demonstration that affects, but something that is consistently and, and, and that's dialoguing with, with the, the, the new political consent, uh, the new framework of political consent that is fragmented and that it's a continuous process. And third uh, is that by doing that, uh, we can build a, 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 um, a, an existing community that can react to political cycle really quickly. Uh, uh, so resisting to some absurd <laughs> decision-making processes, or even uh, uh, grabbing and grasping opportunities that are created by the political cycle. So uh, I'm passing the majority of that. So, uh, 
So basically, I'm sorry. So uh, just to, to get to a concrete thing. So uh, NOSAS was, was, uh, is the organization that is this hub of civic mobilization infrastructures, of local civic mobilization infrastructures. And the, the original uh, mobilization infrastructure that we created was Mill Hill, so my Rio in 2011. And, and Mill Hill is a multi-cause uh, uh, and locally focused uh, organization uh, that works at, at, at the intersection of online and offline mobilization. And uh, nowadays, Mill Hill counts with um, more or less in the membership of Mill Hill is, is over 10% of voters of the city of Rio. So over 400,000 people that participates to Mill Hill's actions. Uh, of course, it's not about all the actions because we're not treating about general consent because consent is fragmented, but many of those actions. Uh, and, and second of all, uh, Mill Hill has, uh, through those mobilizations, changed over 100 public policies in Rio de Janeiro, so in the city of Rio. And, and, um, and, and then we, re we started replicating this model in 2015 to other Brazilian cities. We're now present in 12 Brazilian cities, so Sao Paulo, Recife, João Pessoa, and other cities. And, uh, Amongst our, our, our results, since it's a multi-cause, uh, the civic mobilization for structure is not thematic, it's not environmental or human rights driven, it's, it's completely multi-cause. It's, it's a way of affecting public policy. So the way that we, we, uh, that we, have, we have results that can be macro level results of regulatory policy, since, for instance, uh, changing completely the, the, the regulation of the basic uh, um, sanitation system in Brazil, in Rio. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm from Rio, so I have the tendency to see that Brazil is real. So it's a, it's a, All it's a very, it's, yes. it's very. <laughs> so this is one of our, uh, uh, our our important victories, and this is one of the the taxes that we use. <laughs> uh, but also, we we uh, we've banned plastic straws in many cities in Brazil. Uh, we, uh, we managed to, to change uh, uh, the way that uh, corrupt people uh, could not be any longer nominated to public official uh, um, uh, um, positions in, 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 in many cities in Brazil. Uh, and also uh, micro-level um, impact uh, 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 on public impl implementation. For instance, uh, we, we were able to expel the police that was uh, invading and occupying illegally uh, poor houses uh, and turning them into military bases. As you know, Brazil has the most, the most violent police in, in, in the world, and Rio has the most violent police uh, uh, from Brazil. So, uh, so it was not a, at all easy. But, uh, so, and, and also we, 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 we prevented many displacements of poor communities in Recife. So uh, the, 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 let's say the, the, uh, the range of, of kinds of mobilizations that go from human rights to environmental issues to um, uh, housing issues, uh, it's, it's, it's very big, but it's, what is most important is making sure that we have this constant infrastructure that can uh, affect public policy. And it's particularly uh, important uh, since, uh, for two reasons, uh, I think. The first one is, uh, I'm, I'm a I, I'm a political scientist, I have a master in, in public administration, and, and one of the things that really, uh, as, as a public administrator, having a formation as a public administrator, one of the things that drives me crazy is how, how uh, especially in developing countries, and especially in Brazil, is how we depend on politicians to have decisions being made. And, and one of the, my dreams was, how can we guarantee that, that important public policy, uh, uh, a long-term public policy could survive power alternation? And, uh, and a civic mobilization infrastructure can address those issues. Uh, we have an example, for instance, in Sao Paulo, uh, where uh, the former mayor, uh, Fernando Haddad, who just lost the presidential election, uh, he did many things in the city. And amongst one of his public policies was exactly uh, one public policy that uh, our organization in Sao Paulo was pressuring him to do, that was to close uh, the main avenue of the city for, for cars in order to create public space. Uh, because Sao Paulo has a lacking pro public space problem and, and, and space for leisure uh, problem, especially in the poorest neighborhoods. So, so the idea of closing a very well-connected uh, avenue was important in order to uh, create this leisure. At the beginning, the mayor didn't want to do this, this policy, 
but finally, he, he, after the, we pressured him a lot, hundreds of thousands of people uh, uh, pressuring uh, the mayor, he closed uh, the, the, the avenues at, at Sundays for cars, and, and it became a, a, a major success. So people were really using this, this, this new infrastructure of the city as a leisure space. And uh, when, when he was not re-elected, the only and the single policy that was maintained by his successor was this one. Because it was not a, 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 a technocratical decision, it was not a, a partisan decision, but it was a citizen-led uh, uh, and citizen-driven um, uh, 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 decision. So, so I think this is super important in order to, to guarantee continuity over power transitions, and especially important uh, in a context where we live under more and more populism, and especially now that we had president, catastrophic presidential elections in Brazil, uh, uh, where we have elected a half-fascist, half-clown as a president, and, uh, and who, who says he will fight activism. So it was his first speech um, after the, the, the first round of the elections, he will put an end to all kinds of activism in Brazil. Orban didn't say that. He did that, but <laughs> he didn't say that when he was elected. So let's see what Bolsonaro intends to do. So this is really important to make sure that, that civil society has, uh, has, has a vibrant constituency uh, and can mobilize and can change public policy because under uh, populist leadership, it will be important to have th those kinds of citizen intermediation and making sure that the only intermediation left we have are not only our charismatic populist, half clown, half fascist leaders. That's it. Great. Thank you, Thank you very much for that. So um, a di an important distinction that has been put on the table by Miguel Lago is thinking about the difference between electoral politics, uh, very much about which uh, Jane Green discussed, uh, and then continuous politics, uh, having uh, organized citizens brought uh, there to demand policies and perhaps to, to resist against certain policies uh, if, if they want to. And that's something that we want to bring back in the discussion later. But next I want to uh, turn to uh, Benjamin Snow because he's been thinking about the problem. Yesterday we talked about the role of, uh, of, of digitalization of government. Uh, and we talked largely about government as being delivering services uh, and, and can it do that better. Um, well, government serves people, uh, and Benjamin Snow is asking, uh, how can you use technology to bring people into politics and bring people closer to policy? Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, uh, kind of building on this idea of the future of representation in, in national government and also what does that look like on a local level, um, I started a, a company three years ago called Civocracy, um, really kind of looking at some of these problems that have been, I think, mentioned several times this morning. So I think there couldn't be a better in introduction than uh, David Fine talking about we need new structures in government and we need to understand what those structures can look like. And then of course uh, Jane Green Im immediately starts talking about how do we connect people and how do people feel connected in government. And so thinking about those questions in a, in a deep level but kind of also looking at the problem is how do we bridge the gap between normal people and their democratic representatives to rebuild trust. And so what we've seen is that there is a trust problem um, and kind of can't be doubted. I think enough people have talked about it in the last two days, um, but it bears re-mentioning. So 60% of people do not trust their government. That is across the Western world, that is in democracies, that is country by country, you can look through it. Uh, that's, and it's been declining. So more and more people do not trust their government and that is, uh, a pretty sad state. So people's affiliation by party, voter turnout, kind of any way you look at it, uh, it's not looking great. Um, and 54% of people in democracies feel like their voice doesn't matter. So when we talk about these radical uh, distrusts and resentments that arise, we can look at a lot of causes for them. So we can look at inequality and we can look at uh, you know, housing prices and we can look at uh, poverty and we can look at lots of causes, but if people feel fundamentally disconnected by how decisions are made, that's rough, guys. Um, there was somebody who was talking about really uh, democracy is an experiment that we've seen since World War II and we don't know how it's going to turn out. Uh, but since World War II and especially in the last few decades, we've seen a rapidly declining uh, affinity towards party politics and towards kind of the status quo institutions that we've set up. And so kind of looking at what are structures that can help rebuild that or rebuild trust in that is something that we try to focus on. Meanwhile, 
not thinking about the citizens, but actually thinking about the government uh, uh, workers themselves and people working within government, is if you talk to government uh, workers, many of them say that they don't have the training to reach their citizens, they don't have the training, they, the communication tools are not there, and, and they don't have the tools. So they both don't have the tools they need to do their job, and they don't have the training. And this isn't your average person in government. These are people working in communication departments. These are people working in citizen engagement departments. So these are the people whose primary task is to reach citizens don't feel like they're capable of doing it or that they have the ability or training to do it. So what does that leave us with? In a power vacuum, when people feel resentment, that leaves a power vacuum which can often result in populism. So it often results in people, because they don't feel heard, they start electing people who use phrases like throw the bums out. And so I think that many people can say that party affiliation and, and kind of there, there are different uh, ideas to this, but the post polling on Brexit found that many people weren't voting for Brexit. People were Googling what is Brexit the day afterwards. It was a no vote on we don't really believe this system is working for us. And the fact that we're using kind of ham-handed referendums to try to make large-scale decisions and every once in a blue moon we decide to ask citizens directly, you can expect that they feel like it's the one chance they get to stick it to them. And so, of course, these are the results we get. But most of us know that government in its day-to-day -day form does not look like this. It looks like this. So local government, hopefully the reference carries, so uh, local government is, is what most people actually affects their lives. Local government and regional government is, are the ones who are making the core decisions that people most care about. And that is kind of universally seen, uh, is, is when people kind of focus on the social level, levels or when they're talking about the economy very broadly, the average citizen tunes out very quickly. Whereas if you're talking about the local school that's closing or the local road that's getting built, it's a very different conversation. So I always ask this, and it's a bit of a risk, but how many of you, when it wasn't your obligation as your job, went to a town hall meeting or interacted with your government in any way in the last year? Hands up. Okay, this is the highest I've ever had. <laughs> I think it's 40%, and we are at the Blavatnik School of Government <laughs> challenges of government conference. Why is that? It's because you will only go when you care so much about what issue is being discussed that you're willing to leave the kids with a sitter, drive to the place, pay for parking, and spend a whole evening listening to sometimes crazy people yell at the government. So that's a pretty high barrier. So our kind of basic contention is technology has allowed us to have immediacy and, and kind of given us great efficiencies in many ways, and yet your main way of interacting with the government is in person or maybe a physical letter, if you're lucky, an email, and that is not the best communication tools we have on offer. So what we focus on is, first, how do you connect government uh, citizens to government on a local level? And this is two things. There are two contentions here. One is it's better communication, so people feel heard. People feel part of a process. But two, lots of empirical research has been done that may, has found that if you make decisions with a small group of experts versus a small group of experts and a bunch of random average people, the second group always makes better decisions, whether it's guessing the weight of a, you know, of an object, whether that's public policy across the board. This has been tested empirically for years. So how do we not only improve this relationship and decrease this resentment, but how do we actually make better decisions by including citizens directly? So what we found is the kind of contention is that this would help people feel more engaged. Thank you, McKinsey, for doing what I'm sure was a very expensive study and finding that, yes, people feeling engaged in their local government or feeling engaged in their decision making increases their happiness by 25%. So more so than almost any other factor, you can look at like job loss, you can look at kind of lots of other things that affect your happiness. Feeling part of your local community is a big factor. So what we do is we work with local governments, regions, national governments, helping them engage citizens directly in the contention that it will make people happier and they'll make better decisions. Luckily, we have a few factors going in our favor that more and more there's either a feeling of obligation that they should be doing this or there's actually national legislations that say on big consultations they have to be doing this. So I've talked to people who 
said in South Africa, this is required. There's a new law in the Netherlands that makes this required. So more and more, this is going from being a kind of cool, innovative, techie thing to do to being what should be the status quo. So eventually, we believe this is the, this is the future of having electricity in the city. First, it was a couple cities doing it, and it was kind of, they were the cool, innovative cities. Now, if your city doesn't have running water and electricity, you look a little bit behind. So we build a platform. So we, we built a technology platform that is specifically designed to make it very easy for citizens to give feedback, both new ideas, new propositions, but also to discuss uh, government consultations, so government projects or things that are in the works. And so what we did is the reason we built something ourselves is that we don't believe that traditional social media is built for good decision making. I don't think it's a very hard, I'm seeing a lot of nodding, so it's a, it's a great megaphone. Arab Spring, it was a great megaphone. It was a really bad you know, decision making tool. And so we built our own tool to say, how do you make it really good? How do you make it familiar? How do you make it feel achievable? How do you make it feel like something people can uh, relate to? So we've kind of built that out, and we've seen that it, it was a, an iterative process to find. So kind of yesterday, uh, the woman from McKinsey talked about Agile. The first version of this cost us under 2,000 euros to build before it was bought by the first city. Now it, we've spent another few hundred thousand euros on it, so it works a little bit better. But you don't have to have the perfect to begin is I guess the point I'm making, is the kind of agile idea of testing is, is actually really important and proved itself out in our case. And so I'll talk about very briefly a couple examples of what we've done. So the region of Avan rhone alp in France, they were changing a 10-year infrastructure uh, program in the region. They were, they were planning out their next year, 10 years of their infrastructure. And so they wanted to engage both experts, kind of stakeholder engagement, stakeholder management, but also average citizens for new ideas. And from that, they got the priorities of Let's make sure to look at rivers. Let's make sure to look at local transportation. But they actually got the idea of what if we use seasonably, seasonally used train stations as co-working spaces during the months that they're not used. This was something that had never occurred to the government, was on nobody's radar, and was a really good idea coming from average citizens. Um, another one is we, we looked at biodiversity improvement in the Netherlands, in North Holland. So they were changing a biodiversity law, and they had the law written, and they wanted to open it up to experts and citizens. And from that, they actually had 10 ideas from citizens that went word for word into the policy white paper. So these were good ideas from citizens that went directly into government in three months, into legislation, which they referred to as light speed in government uh, timelines. So this is this is... How do we, how do we, because then people feel like it wasn't four years later that they got a note, thank you for your submission. It was three months later, they're in the law. The third one is a little bit different. So we talked to an organization in Brussels. They said, we work in international security. We, we have lots of partners we work with. Getting the ideas from them is very difficult. So what we did with them was a two-day online global international security conference. So the international security conference in Munich you go, you have a coffee, you talk to six people, and you watch someone speak. That's kind of the traditional conference model. This one is much better. Uh, <laughs> but what they said was, we want to engage people much more widely. And so what they had was they had many partners, VIP speakers, but what they had was two days online with people from 122 countries, uh, over 2,000 experts talking about six thematic areas. One thing they noted was the gender parity was much better than you'll see anywhere else. So it was close to 50-50 on many issues. And then they were actually, we were able to see people interacting collectively rather than it being a one-to-many interaction. So it wasn't someone speaking. It was many people collectively finding consensus with those ideas then getting disseminated to NATO, uh, different military governments, uh, NORAD, et cetera. And so what we see is this can actually find consensus, find better ideas, but then have outcomes come with it. So when we started, uh, we had some run-ins. So we had OK technology. We had bad communication. And so one thing we see is it's not just about the, the topic area and the technology. It's about knowing how to reach people and reach citizens, and that that's a core and fundamental part of it. If anybody comes to you selling you technology, it's, and it's technology for a purpose of reaching citizens, technology doesn't, never cuts it. It's always about the communication. It's always about the collaboration. So now we've built features that allow that to happen much better, and that's helped. 
So now we're working on the national level in France and starting to also work with EU institutions. And we think that this is where the real opportunity is. The reason we're doing this as a company and not with individual cities is as a platform, you can see that it's citizen to city, but actually cities all deal with the same problems. So if you're on one platform, cities can actually learn from each other. And then you can actually see that the region is also involved. So citizens in one place can see what's happening in their city, their region, their national government, and on an EU level. And that's something that's radically different. So it's, it's how do you make this so it's not, I need to download six different apps to talk to six different branches of government, but how do you make this all in one place where there's an actual iterative aspect to it? So that's the goal, is to make this really a network that people can learn from over time. Thanks very much. So I, I want to give the audience a chance to, to ask some questions, but I, I first want to to, if, if you like, take the challenge Jane posed to both of you, because you, you both talked about ways that citizens um, can come in and demand things from government to make it better. Um, but you talked about things that were essentially um, easier consensus issues. They were valence issues. We can do things better. We can get people, uh, you know, uh, not having public defecation. Um, you know, we can, we can um, bring citizen ideas where there's, there's a great deal of consensus, but there's not a lot of consensus in certain areas. Um, and certain areas um, on this libertarian authoritarian axis, um, they, they, they create quite a lot of conflict um, uh, be between different groups. Um, so can these sorts of problems deal with uh, the challenges of People are angry about immigration, and how do we do this well while being uh, fair with, with our immigration policy? Do you want to take it? You can go first. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so uh, so uh, in our case, I, I presented just a few of examples, but, uh, but the majority of our campaigns are quite conflictuous and, and not contentious at all. And we have uh, lots of problems with government, with the police, with any... Uh, so when, when, we, when we, we had anti-corruption campaigns, we had many problems with, with, with the governor, former governor of Rio, that now it's, uh, it's in jail. Uh, uh, we, we, uh, yeah. uh, uh, we, we were th many times threatened uh, by the police uh, because of our fight against police violence and human rights violation by the police. Uh, so uh, uh, we, 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 we are always uh, uh, working on conflictuous issues. Uh, which doesn't mean that we, we all obtain victories in uh, the non-consensual issues. Uh, in fact, the, 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 the easiest victories are always with consensual issues, like plastic straws, for instance. So, uh, wh but wh where is imbalance of, uh, of power? Uh, uh, you, you need to... Uh, I believe that the main purpose of a civic mobilization infrastructure is making sure that we can deal with conflict in a pacific way. So, so, so I, I think it's important to, to tackle non-consensual issues, making sure that we can uh, leverage the political capital for some important issues, and making sure that we can, we can have more balanced decisions. Benjamin. I, I kind of reject the, the premise of the question to some degree. Is I think I that... Going to the Oxford first. <laughs> I, I think that people, the, the assumption is that these local issues are the ones that everyone is kind of holding hands and happy smiling people on. It's really not. It's people actually feel very disconnected from the national conversation because they don't relate to that conversation. Whereas if you want to get people really fired up, talk about scooters being in bike lanes versus being on roads. Uh, talk about dog poop cleanup. Uh, these are things people care a lot about and are very fired up about. A local school closing. A local school closing affects your life, if you are a parent, much more directly than, it, than any national conversation that's going on vaguely about the economy in many ways. And so I, what we do, we've done stuff around changing city level education policy where you see thousands of people participating and very passionate about, because the, the, when you change the school day, that affects that person's ability to leave or stay at work. You know, these are things that really matter in people's day-to-day -day life. That's why we started with them, is because those are the ones that actually people care about more than when you try to have kind of these um, vaguer, sometimes national-level uh, conversations. I'll also accept, however, that when you try to have these very high-level, national-level conversations and you're starting out, uh, getting the national government on the phone when you don't have some early... Uh, case studies is a harder thing. So it's actually, it was an easier uh, way to start. Prototyping on a local level is easier, so to speak. And so for us, yeah, that was a, a part of it is by starting on the local level, it's also an easier thing to get many 
uh, runs at bat uh, rather than kind of starting on the national or the international level. But I think that kind of Jane's contention was people don't feel like government is working for them, I believe were her exact words. And by showing really practical implementation and really practical issues that affect their lives, that changes that feeling, which I, then, I think can uh, kind of also affect how they feel on the, the regional and the national level. Great. Um, the floor is open for questions. I've got one in the back. I've got one in the back here. We're going to take three at a time, and I've got one in the front here. So can we get a microphone in the back? Uh, man with a beard. <laughs> Sorry. The blue shirt beard. Um, thank you. I, I just wanted to say thank you to all the panelists. A fantastic talk today and, and the different perspectives. Really, really great. Um, I, I wanted to, Ben, I appreciate you pushing back on the question and, and I want to push back a little bit on you for a minute if I can and, and see if you can uh, address this. And, and maybe it also goes to um, Professor Green's point about um, voting. So in, in where I'm from, civic engagement through digital um, communications and, and um, is quite advanced. I live in Vancouver, and every public project has this kind of built-in process. Nobody believes it. So you engage the public, and uh, there's all this data that disappears, and then the government does something that everybody thinks nobody asked for. So how do you deal with that um, either cynicism or reality of governments not responding to this engagement if we see e-tools as an engagement process? Um, and, and does that explain perhaps um, the desire of people to be engaged in the political uh, processing in voting, um, but not because they're not interested in, in other views, but because they're um, throw the bums out because um, they're tired of um, having processes that seem actually not to work. Great. So we're going to take two more questions, but uh, Jane Green liked that question so much she wanted to add to it. So you just wanted. <laughs> yeah, I just think that, you know, one of the kind of absolutely crucial things is accountability. It's that sense that because you know about something, because you care about something, and because you know who the political actor is that's done it, you can then hold them accountable. And I, I worry, with your example too, that that's the problem, right? Is that nobody's accountable for whether or not those things are implemented and whether or not that's a transparent process and whether that's a meaningful process. And I, I worry that governance happens in such a diffuse way. So where everyone's blaming somebody else. Right? So it's, it's not the government, it's the PFI. It's not the government, it's the local authority. It's not the government, it's whoever, whoever, whoever. Or maybe it's the citizens who claimed they wanted to ban plastic straws and now you know, there's some like, terrible consequence or something. You know, and I think that this is like one of the absolute crucial challenges that if, you know, the, whilst I think this is absolutely wonderful what I've heard this morning, you know, it's like how does that improve the accountability of government so people can really hold actors accountable for their genuine actions. And I think in Brexit, you know, in our instance, essentially you could, it was all about the government, right? There was only one person or one actor that was going to do something about Brexit. And I think perhaps that's, that's maybe why people are engaging in the political process a bit more at the moment, perhaps. I mean, yeah. Okay, great. Um, there was a question over here in, in the back. Uh, so thanks for, for the talk. Uh, I'm Pedro. I'm a st student here at the MPP. I'm also Brazilian. Uh, well, I think my question is, uh, is uh, I think either Miguel or Benjamin can kind of comment on it. Um, in Brazil, um, I think everybody has seen that recently a lot of use of bots to influence online political debates and even uh, some voting decisions. Uh, the Senate in Brazil often opens some polls uh, to ask citizens about some very uh, controversial bills. And that, there has been also some... Uh, uh, cases in which bots have been influencing uh, the voting for that as well. Uh, I don't understand much how it goes on, but um, how it happens. But maybe these online voting proce procedures can also be used uh, to, to make really great changes in a, in a non-democratic uh, uh, way, in a sense. I'm not sure how we can avoid that. 
A lot has been said about Twitter yesterday, for instance. Uh, so I, just to put it in a question, how can we guarantee that these voting processes or participation processes, especially those online, as you've uh, mentioned, how can we guarantee that they actually reach those who need it and they are not influenced by these external actions? Okay, great. Uh, so I've got a couple more hands up, uh, but I, I had a hand here first, and I'll get, I'll, I'll get these two on the next round. Yes, I see them, and, and on the back. Uh, so, so microphone here, uh, gentleman without a beard. Hello. <laughs> so, uh, Benjamin, what, first of all, you showed a picture where bottom left was uh, Beppe Grillo, who is the five-star movement crazy guy. Uh, they are in power because of a similar platform to the one that you're building. Similar, not the same, different purposes. It's more about choosing people than choosing programs. But at the end of the day, that tells me that uh, in any case, it's much more about the policies and the rules that regulate those platforms than the technology itself, obviously. So the question is, what do you think needs to be improved to become a really mainstream tool? I guess uh, there was an implicit answer in the question coming from behind me. That was, so that's the one. Number two, uh, that's more for you, which is when I grew up in the 70s, uh, the dissatisfaction against the government was obviously clear, right? Red brigades were killing people and there are millions of students and uh, workers on the streets protesting. How is that mistrust versus government different than the one you're describing today? So that's an excellent question, and um, I'm going to turn to the panel, but we did invite Movimento Cinque Stelle to come and present Rousseau, their program. They didn't get back to us, uh, but so, so we tried to sort of bring in reflection on, on, on how they're thinking about it as well. Benjamin. So uh, starting with the, the first question, I think um, I know some about the Vancouver example. I think how you, I, I think it goes to the second question as well, you, kind of all three, is how you do this is really important. Technology is not a moral, it, it, it doesn't care. How you design and how you set the rules of it and how you, how you do the engagement matters a lot. People doing this poorly, whether it's technologically poorly, whether the communication is poor, or whether they're using it for kind of poor means, or with little accountability or involvement of government, really affects the outcome. And I think that's actually really, really important, is if people do something in this area, in civic tech, it's not all roses. Is If it's done poorly, it will have a, a really big effect, my fear, for 10 years. So people tried to do this five or eight years ago and did it with really bad technology and bad communication. And it actually kind of burned, uh, particularly in Germany, kind of burned anybody in government wanting to do it for several years because it had been done so poorly uh, from a technological perspective. Um, I think now you see similar instances where if the communication is done bad and citizens don't trust it, they're not going to try it again two or three or four more times. So that's where, while agile and testing and things like this is nice, you also, like, having people understand what's happening and how much uh, potential there is for change on a given issue and things like that is really important, or else you risk uh, actually making things worse. And so I think that in kind of all of these cases, being really kind of thoughtful and careful of understanding both the kind of policy side of it, the technology side of it, and the communication side of it is um, really important. I think to, to your point, things we try to do in that case is, uh, one, we have to have government buy-in, and normally we push them for some sort of outcome or some sort of uh, potential real outcome that can come from it. In many cases, that's not what citizens are looking for. The biggest impact for citizens is knowing that they've been heard. They don't always want their way. There's kind of an assumption that people are just looking to have their way and that it'll go really negative if they don't. We have thousands of citizens in Strasbourg and Lyon talking about education right now. We have moderated zero comments. When I hear people hear that and hear about the internet, kind of the assumption is the internet is a terrible place. Zero comments. So people, if you design it right and if you set it up right, people can actually be really positive towards things. But part of that is communicating to them what can the potential outcome be and that you, you kind of, two, accountability works both ways. Is one thing we tell government is if you make a decision in the dark and then it goes wrong, they're going to come with pitchforks. That happens. And so what you need to do is open this up to them. Then when it goes really poorly in two years, you have an audit trail on the internet of here's how much we tried to involve you in this process. Here's all the feedback of yours that we incorporated into this. So that when you get these kind of policy mess ups, 
in some way or another, you have some way of say, kind of holding blame, not just to these four or five leaders sometimes who are making decisions with very few resources on very little time, with very little expertise, but you're able to kind of own that collectively as a community, and I think that's important. Um, to, the, to the case of how it can be influenced, I'll, I'll go really briefly, but by one, uh, there are things you can do to kind of basic security things you can do to try to weed that out. Two, what, our, what we've built is not about voting, it's not about 50 people like this and 51 people like that. It's not about polling. It's not about you feel good today. It's not about scraping things from across the internet. We're looking for really qualitative kind of, that's a really bad data point. Yes or no is a really bad data point. How strongly do you care about this? How do you, what, what would change your mind? How does that opinion change over time? Uh, what other ideas do you have for a problem? That's a deeper data point. And so what we do is actually look for much stronger uh, feedback from citizens, which gets less feedback, but actually is much less trollable. Because if people say some random stuff, it just kind of naturally filters out from the people who are saying really constructive, uh, helpful ideas. And if you make it just polling yes or no, you lose all of that. And it's much more susceptible to abuse. Um, and to Diego, that's a, I, I don't know enough about the Five Star Movement's platform, but I would kind of say the same thing again, where how you do this matters a lot. Um, and how you design it and what you use it for matters a lot. Um, and so I'm happy to kind of continue that conversation, but I think that's kind of broadly the point is that technology can be used in really bad ways, um, and, but it doesn't mean it can't be also harnessed to kind of solve some of these problems. Miguel. I think, I think government is, a, is an arbitration of uh, different kinds of interests and, and pressures. Uh, and uh, well, we have corporate lobbying that is well, very well organized. You have political parties, trade unions, many kinds of interests of society that are well represented and that do pressure decision makers. What we don't have uh, in, a, in a consistent way is a, a, a citizen kind of lobbying or advocacy uh, continuously in order to, to pressure as well uh, as the corporate lobbying does, as well as political parties does. So, so I think the first, the first, first importance when, when, when we're dealing with technology and civic participation is how is this affecting the power imbalances that exist in society? And, and, and how, can, how can we make sure that, that, that citizens really can impact uh, decision making? Not the, only the decision making that the government is willing uh, to open for them, uh, uh, but also, this is important, but also the decisions that the, the, the own uh, citizens want to conquer through their mobilization. So, so I think both are very important in order to have a much more participatory government. But, but the thing is that uh, I, uh, I really believe that the, the players that are playing a game uh, and are, they're, they're winning at this game has, has few interests to change the rules of this game. And, and uh, so I see, I see how the government let's say, delegating power to citizens <laughs> uh, um, without being really pressured to do that. So, so I think that's also important. And, and concerning the bots, it depends exactly on the design of the platform. I totally agree. And the, the, the Senate platform of, of Brazilian Congress is awful. So uh, that, that's, that's why robots are so, <laughs> so useful there. <laughs> um. Jane, Diego put a question to you, and uh, Benjamin put forward a notion of accountability that spun back towards the citizens, and I wondered what you thought about that, where the citizens were involved, and therefore when the policy went bad, you know, maybe they, uh, they bore some responsibility themselves. Does that work? So um, I wanted to say something in response to this question first, which is that I'm not sure if trust is declining in government. And the reason I'm not sure is because there's huge variation cross-nationally. So if you look to the US, you'll see decline in trust in government. If you look to the UK, I honestly can't tell you what the answer is because the data doesn't go back far enough. And also, actually, I think we've always mistrusted our government. Um, so in a sense, you know, what is the palpable change? Because we would all say, well, hang on a minute. It's all very well for you to say, well, the data, the data, data. But there's a palpable sense that something's changed. And I, you know, it's, I, but I would sort of pose that as a puzzle and pose that as a question because I'm not convinced that it's just a very simple story that trust in government's decline, with your example being a great one, you know, that actually let's go back in the past and we can find lots of examples of, you know, huge hostility towards government. We also see in this country examples where liberal authoritarian issues were more important, when volatility was very high, you know, so partly it's a frame of time reference problem. But I think, you know, if I were just to say that here's my gut, 
I mean, comes back to the challenge about accountability, is that in the past, I think people knew how to change the system and they knew who was responsible. And I'm just saying, that's my view. I don't know if I'm right. I don't know if that's the thing that's changed, but that's how it feels to me. That, you know, in the past, if you're upset about something, it was the system, it was the government that was responsible. I mean, I'm thinking about the countries that I know best. And I think now, subsequently, it's a sense of, well, who is responsible? How can we change this? Is it ever going to be any different? Is the system ever going to work? And I think, you know, if it's the case that citizen movements make people more engaged and make the process more transparent, then that's a really healthy thing for accountability. So one way that people can change the system uh, is by getting elected. Uh, and one of our MPPs, Felipe, Felipe Rigoni, succeeded in getting elected in this Brazilian election that's been um, the subject of much discussion. Um, and he did this against many disadvantages, uh, coming from a reformist party. Um, but he was gifted with long sight in politics, but not with a conventional uh, uh, gift of sight. And Felipe, I wonder if you can just say briefly um, why it is you succeeded as a reformist politician um, in an election that had so much pushback against um, uh, the, the, the establishment. Well, first of all, thank you very much. And to answer that question, I would need another panel, but well, we can give some some highlights. And I think that we, we overall, don't like politicians like long highlights. We want yes. highlights. Yes. <laughs> but the overall theme of my election, it, it was civic engagement, actually. Because my, my, both my campaign and my mandate, they were built on collective action. So we had more than 2,000 volunteers in our mandate. We're going to have a, an app that people can actually interact with us. I'm going to have a board of institutions and specialists that are going to decide with me everything that I'm going to decide in the national parliament. So I think the overall theme of our success has to do with civic engagement. And, of course, a well-used social media strategy. Because we were like in the middle of two populist narratives, one from the extreme right, one from the left. And that was very hard for, for candidates like me, which are basically reformists. And we had to use a very well-designed strategy in social media, plus the civic engagement that we did. So basically, what Melhio does and what Civocracy does is what we try to do in a campaign, and is what we're going to do in our mandate too. But I, I also have a question, if you, if you permit me. <laughs> because people are extremely engaged in the local level, as Benjamin just said. So when, when we're discussing the dog poop cleaning, the things that actually interfere in their daily lives in that city, they are both knowledgeable and they live the situations. So the opinions are much more well built and it's really really nice the civic engagement but in the national level when you have to translate what the national decisions are actually going to interfere in their daily local life how do you do that without going to the way of a populist narrative because this is really hard and i still don't have the answer so that's my, that's why i asked the question because in the national level it's really hard it's complex you have a lot of data and it does interfere in the, in the local life, but to connect that with the local life without a populist narrative is very really hard. And I, do, I still don't have the answer, so that was my question. <laughs> so I, I want to turn that question briefly back to the panelists. I'm going to do what political parties are so often accused of doing, which is disenfranchise the voices uh, from the people, uh, because I'm, I'm facing severe constraints, these, in this case on time. But I want to give each of you a brief uh, chance to comment on, on what Felipe had to say. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I appreciate that um, your kind of encouragement of civic engagement. And I, I also appreciate the idea that on the local level, kind of people are experts of their own lives. And, and kind of that uh, engagement on a civic, in a civic local level is much easier than on a national level. I think that the interesting thing that we find a lot of times is not that people don't understand how a tax cut could affect their life or, or kind of their local context. In many cases, the communication is so bad that people don't even understand which branch of government or which area of government is going to affect a decision. So when people talk about this, uh, kind of Jane mentioned, like, they don't know who's responsible for something, is we've literally done things where we're just explaining to people, no, this is the region's job, not the city's job. They deal with transportation, and you're complaining to the wrong people. 
And so part of just like in a very basic way, I think sometimes people's kind of civic understanding or, or understanding of kind of the local to the, to the national context is, is so um, disaffected from actually how the decisions get made and who's making the decisions and under what domains decisions are get, getting made that it's just educating on that level allows people to kind of see kind of how it can affect their lives in a more basic way and kind of who's responsible for it. But I, I also don't really have an answer for, yeah. as you go up to the national level, I, I think the kind of thing we've seen is we've gone from kind of city level to a regional level involving kind of millions of people. And now we're starting to look at national level um, priorities with specific ministries. And the thing that we kind of really try to target is I think part of the reason populism uh, and, and part of the reason the national conversation can get co so convoluted is because it's trying to have 15 different discussions at once. It's very broad and very vague. And so what we try to do is keep it as super object-oriented as possible. And so even if you're talking about a national level, it's about a specific policy, it's about a specific law, it's about a specific um, agenda item. And I think that that helps quite a bit more than when you have these very broad conversations about uh, freedom or liberty that sometimes can get hijacked because it's kind of too many floating variables. And so that's maybe one small contention towards it that we attempt. Yeah, brief. <laughs> so I think the best way to fight populism and populist leaders is with popular movements. We should not be uh, uh, scared with the crowds. We should be scared about populist leaders. Uh, and, and I think that the way of doing that, uh, because populism speech is only about empty signifiers. It's not concrete. It's only about feelings. Uh, uh, so, so what I think is essential is to make sure that we can turn national discussion into local action. Because when you go to action and, you, and concrete action and how I go, I'm going to affect this specific public policy, uh, you, you change completely the narrative and the empty signifiers uh, don't make sense any longer. So, uh, so I really believe that we, can, we need to do uh, popular movements, mass movements, n not in a populist way, uh, in a pragmatical way, uh, action-driven and, and public decision-driven. And the city is the best place for that. So we hope that the future of politics is people fired up, people fired up in a positive way. We've got three outstanding parallel sessions that are going to follow after a very, very brief coffee break. So please join me in thanking the panel. So, ladies and gentlemen, as we, as we heard, uh, we want to enfranchise you all, and that means choosing one of the three fantastic panels that are now available to you. So please make an active choice. Get along there, and as they say in elections, uh, make sure that your voice counts. Uh, we'd like to see you participate 